I want to welcome those who are joining us as well by live stream. It's good to have them uh, be a part of our service as well. And uh, when Pastor Hans asked me if I would fill in, since I knew he was going to be away with a little time with his family, I've been thinking about our month of missions that we have been uh, celebrating here, using every Sunday during February. And of course, uh, next week we also have uh, Mishko Horvatek from Croatia, who's going to be doing both the live stream and the message as well. And I hope that you will plan to come back for that. So I thought, well, I should do something on missions as well. However, however, I thought I'm not going to go back and see what I've done in the past on missions, such as going through the book of Acts, which I could have found a number of things there, but rather uh, I started to per take personal inventory of what I myself needed when it comes to this issue of being called and being involved in missions. And uh, with that in mind, uh, it resulted in my title this morning uh, that became really, if you please, an exhortation to me. So I get to preach this, first develop it, and then preach it to myself, and you get to listen in, and if God uses it in your life, well, praise the Lord for that as well. And you see what that exhortation is in your bulletin outline, which I would encourage you to take at least and fill in because it's quite simple to do. And it's entitled, Reactivate Yourself for God. Think about that. Reactivate yourself for God. What does that mean to me? Well, that ex exhortation cannot be just a good suggestion or a good idea. It's something that I'm supposed to work down into my life. And I want to work at doing that. Consider me with that word, reactivate. Reactivate. It means to restore something to a state of activity to bring back into action. And I submit to you that when it comes to my part in missions and fulfilling the Great Commission, which we've heard a lot about, that I personally need to reactivate myself for God. Do I give to missions? Yes, I do. Do I pray for missionaries? Yes, daily I do that, maybe rather quickly, but I do. Uh, have I gone on mission trips? Well, you know Mary. So, yes, I've gone on mission trips as well. Why then this personal exhortation from God to me? Reactivate yourself, Bill, for God. To answer that, I'm going to have to use myself in a number of times in this morning's message, and I would ask that you bear with me as I do that. And secondly... My message may be more illustrative than exegetical, you know, verse by verse of Scripture, although I will back up what I say with Scripture, so it'll be there as well. And thirdly, it may seem to you to be more like a classroom setting than a preaching or preached message, but I ask that you would bear with me. So with that introduction, I will seek to apply that exhortation, reactivate yourself for God uh, and I'll start with my first point in your outline. So if you have it there, I really encourage you to fill it out. Who knows? Maybe God will speak to you as well as speaking to me, okay? Number one point, reactivate yourself for God in your heart and prayer life. Reactivate, reactivate yourself for God in your heart and prayer life. Years ago, I heard Dr. Charles Stanley speak, and he said, God will never use you to grow a heart with a dirty heart. I'm sorry, let me restate that. God will never use you to grow a church with a dirty heart. For God to use me, if God is going to use me, I have to have a pure heart. Why, uh, would, that, why, why would I think otherwise? We're going to be concluding our service, worshiping the Lord, centered around the communion table here. And uh, as I think about that and the Lord's atonement and some of the songs that we used this morning uh, focused on that, didn't they? Very good. Appreciate those people leading us in worship in our singing time. Well, in John's gospel, we're told that when Jesus gave the bread and cup to his disciples, he girded himself with a towel and washed each one of his disciples' feet, including, by the way, Judas, who was unsaved who was going to betray him. When he came to Peter, Peter said to him, 
Never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. And Peter responded like Peter would, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Give me the whole bath. Jesus said to him, he who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean. What was he saying there? Look, you put your faith in me. You're saved. You have eternal life, but it's your feet that get dirty. That's why uh, John took that moment, and often our pastor does, where you have a chance, an opportunity to say, Lord, just search me, and if there's sin in my life, just please cleanse me from that. Wash my feet, if you please, by way of illustration, that I might uh, be uh, acceptable in worshiping you and uh, receive what you have from me. I've had that cleansing bath, personally. I know that I'm saved, and therefore I know that I am completely clean. And by the way, you might very well be visiting either here in the auditorium or by live stream, and that may not be true of you. You may be very religious, but you've not had the complete bath. You've not put your faith completely in the Lord Jesus Christ. You're not trusting your religion, a church, a sacrament. No, you're turning and saying, Jesus, you paid it all, all to you, I owe. I'm putting my faith in you to save me. And that's what saves a person when that faith is that kind of faith. But I must let him wash my dirty feet. I must have and keep a pure heart. God will not use you or me if we have a dirty heart. Thinking about missions here. But I must also reactivate my prayer life. That's a challenge. After all, I'm in partnership with God. Think about that. 1 Corinthians 1 brings that out. It is his work. It's his plan. Then how important is it that I wait on him and quiet my heart in his presence and give him the effort to speak to me? And I understand he uses the scripture to do that. But you have the Holy Spirit in you, and he speaks to your heart using the scripture that he authored. I shouldn't do all the talking then, should I? No. Surely God has something to say in this partnership with me and with you as well. Powerful and effective praying, dear, you understand that powerful and effective praying is hard work. Do I hear an amen to that? Amen. Yeah, there you go. You know. You should know it. How did James, Jesus' half-brother, put it? The effective the effective prayer of a righteous man, that includes a righteous woman, by the way, don't want to leave that out, can accomplish much. That's a great request. That's a great promise, I should say. James 5, 16. In partnering with God and getting people saved and growing in their, His grace and knowledge, the Lord Jesus Christ, that is, I must remind myself that this is intense spiritual warfare for you, but also those out on the field, you can't even begin to imagine the battle that they're in, what they're facing, as the devil says. And by the way, Satan is not going to give up those souls around me and out on the mission field without a fight. You should know that. Therefore, I must reactivate myself for God in my heart and my prayer life. But secondly, in your outline, <clears throat> reactivate yourself for God in your home and family. I won't be able to exhaust this. I might exhaust you, but uh, this is a huge realm to develop here. But reactivate yourself for God in your home and family. If I reactivate myself for God in my heart and in my prayer life, the first and primary place that is going to show up is in my home and family, right? Yeah. Yeah. Things will dramatically change in your home. <laughs> Even as a little child, I remember my grandpa on my dad's side who lived up the path from us having that big black Bible on his lap every morning. When my dad got right with the Lord, that took some time doing, things really changed in our home. There was no more alcohol. He was really quite a drinker, and they loved the Saturday night uh, time doing that with friends. Dad, bo, lo and behold, he started taking mom and the three of us kids to church every Sunday. Can you believe that? No, not just Sunday morning. No, Sunday school, Sunday morning worship, Sunday night. And they had a Wednesday night prayer meeting. We went to that as well. 
I missed all those things on television on Sunday night. Boy, Rin Tin Tin and Lassie and so forth. Ed Sullivan. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. I understand that. Okay. Yeah. You, <laughs> yeah. In fact, Dad even began uh, having uh, devotionals. Got the card table out, and the five of us stood around the sat around the card table, and uh, he he would have devotions. And uh, I've said before, he loved prophecy and scared the liver out of me and I'd go to bed and say oh God I want to be saved I want to go to hell come into my heart please I prayed that prayer many times before I really understood from scripture that uh, when I really put my faith in Jesus I say but things change in our home folks boy if you're saved uh, and you're walking with God things change in your home you have to understand that so often I hear today of people that ask Jesus in their heart and it says if there's no change whatsoever that's an impossibility read the scripture if he comes in your heart and life, things change. Now, I know uh, there are some dramatic areas, but there's also the fact that there's growth in other areas and you find yourself struggling with sin and those battles, that's part of this journey as well. So I understand that. What effect did this have on me and my home? Like so many people, my life and growing up was a choppy road. I think most people would acknowledge, yeah, yeah, it was not the easiest road, but I never got away from the effects of being raised in a Christian home and atmosphere. It led me to pursue a Christian young lady. I married her. You can pray for her. Yeah. 53 years later. The Bible then had a central place in our home, and our three boys were greatly influenced by the presence of God in our home and they're walking with the Lord today. That's encouraging in our heart. You know that. When you commit yourself to reactivate yourself for God in your home and family, things will change and God will do a work in your home and family as well. When people visit your home, God will use you in a number of different ways. Think about it. He'll use you in a number of different ways, if you're open to it, to touch and work in their lives. Give that some thought, folks. Thinking about missions. Give that some thought. Your kids, for example, will bring their friends over and what they see and what they hear and the open doors the Lord may open will have a direct effect upon their lives in many situations. In the four churches that I have pastored over the 50 years, there have been saved spouses married to unsaved spouses. And uh, sometimes it's uh, two people who get married, they're both unsaved and one comes to saving faith and the other doesn't, maybe for a period of time or never. If that is your situation, I encourage you to reactivate your faith, uh, yourself for God in your home and your family. As I said, in every, all four churches I've had, I've always had folk that that's a situation they find themselves in. I want to share a couple of scriptures with you for your encouragement if that's where you are. Uh, the first is 1 Corinthians 7.14. You can at least write it down there by reactivate yourself for God in your home and family. 1 Corinthians 7, 14, here's what God says. The unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. For otherwise your children are unclean, but now they are holy. Listen, that's encouraging if you're in that situation. What does it mean? God is telling you that he works through you, the believing saved spouse. And because of that, he provides grace that spills over into your unsaved husband or wife's life. And that grace may even bring your unsaved spouse to saving faith. And it definitely has an effect upon your children. By the way, that happened with me because my dad, who got out of fellowship, got married, had three kids, walked away from the Lord, and then God put him through a terrible accident that brought him back. And guess what? My mom got saved, and I got saved, and my brother and sister got saved. So sometimes that's a wonderful effect of that grace spilling over from the one who is saved in the home. But will your unsaved spouse get saved as you day after day live a righteous, godly life and earnestly pray for them? Will they actually get saved? Here's God's answer in verse 16. 1 Corinthians 7, 16. Here's his answer. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? In other words, you be faithful in this mission, this your mission field, 
your home, your marriage, and learn to rest in God by placing the outcome of his all white into his all wise hands. Let me add this. If this describes you and your marriage, ask God to direct you to two or three other brothers or sisters who will confidently join you in prayer daily. I do that, by the way. If I know people that uh, are in a situation like that, I try to faithfully pray for them that God will give them wisdom, give them patience, give them grace, and let that grace pour out over on their unsaved spouse and affect their family as well. And God, I believe, will bless that. But we're told that you also sanctify your children. God says, now they are holy. That means God's grace will also be working in your children because of you, the one saved parent. We have an example of that, I think, over in 1 Timothy 2.15, when he writes to the women there, speaking about the saved wives, Paul writes these words, 1 Corinthians 2.15, women will be saved through bearing of children, if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. Paul is not saying that women get saved eternally, they get their eternal salvation by bearing children. You ought to understand that's not the case, okay? Uh, He's saying that such godly wives and mothers find their primary God-given call and purpose in raising their children for God. That's great. As the MacArthur notes say regarding this verse, I quote, because mothers have a unique bond and intimacy with their children and spend far more time with them than do fathers, they have a greater influence in their lives and thus a unique responsibility and opportunity for rearing godly children. And that's true. We've seen that. We've seen that in the church. Over my years of pastoring, I've seen this played out in a number of divided homes where a spouse is saved, the other is not. Often it is a saved mother who faithfully brings her child or children to church where they're under the teaching of God's life-changing word. They're also affected by other brothers and sisters that minister to them because they bring them to church and they hear the messages, for example, and they're in Sunday school and Bible school, daily vacation Bible school and so forth, Awana and others. And the result of that is that God ministers grace to them and he captures often their hearts, their lives, and they come to saving faith. Isn't that great? Well, that's good. So this challenge is to me as well as each one of you, reactivate yourself for God in your home and family. But we're not through. We're not through. Let's talk briefly about the family. The family. There was a time when our boys, our boys were not saved. They weren't saved. Praise God that said all three are saved and they are walking with the Lord and serving him. Mary's mom also was always an enigma to the son-in-law, okay? <laughs> she, she even lived with us for a number of years, and uh, uh, she uh, believed strongly about keeping parts of the Old Testament law. She knew Jesus was very important to the one salvation, but, but we never could nail her down so we could say with absolute assurance that she had ever come to genuine salvation. That's part of our home, folks, part of our family. And yet we would go right on ministering and praying for her. And as doors of opportunity would open up, we would try to share the gospel. And we trust that she had genuinely put her faith in the Lord and got saved. But we don't know that. We leave that with the Lord. Why I must reactivate myself for God and my family, though. I have six grandchildren. Mary and I are concerned about salvation of four of them. We're concerned about them. And this is a wacky, crazy world that tries to get a hold of them and won't let go. Satan does not want to let go of them. I was powerfully affected, as I said, as a little child by seeing that big black Bible in the mornings on my grandpa's lap and undoubtedly by his and grandma's prayers for me and my brother and sister as well, and for that matter, my dad and mom. I wonder what it is about my life that God might be using in the lives of my grandchildren. I do. I wonder about that. Mary's two brothers are as lost as a goose in a snowstorm. Yeah. And they're quickly running out of time. The two women in their lives and their two sons are also lost, headed to an eternal hell without Christ. If I extend my family to include my siblings and their children, the number of folks that are saved becomes a very large mission field for Mary and me. You see what I'm talking about? God's working in my heart. I want you to understand why I'm bringing this message to me. And God has placed Mary and me in their lives. 
Therefore, I need to spend specific time listening to the Holy Spirit, ready to do His prompting in my response to each of these family members. I need to earnestly pray for each one of them. And do I know whether or not they're going to turn to Christ, repent of their sinful pride and deeds and get saved? No. No, I don't. But I must, I must remember this, folks. That is not even the foremost reason for reactivating myself for God in my home and my family. I want you to get this. The foremost reason for doing so is what? For God's glory. Amen. For God's glory. You need to get that. He says, I want you to glorify me as I place you in this setting where you can minister to these folk as I direct in your life through prayer and through witness and so forth. The foremost reason for doing so is for God's glory. That brings us to number three in our outline. You didn't quit on me, did you? Oh, good, good, good. I go for another hour then. Just want to be sure. <laughs> number three, reactivate yourself for God in your neighborhood. Again, this is preached back to me. Reactivate yourself for God in your neighborhood. Last time I spoke from this pulpit, I gave an illustration of how God sovereignly worked. I'm going to share that illustration with you again because it has such an impact on me, and I trust it will for you as well. It has to do with how God got the gospel to the Stone Age Jolly people in New Guinea, and some of you will remember that. It wasn't very long ago. Stan Dale and Phil Masters, their wives, went to them, with, and many had turned to Christ. Then Stan told them the converted ones needed to bring all their fetishes to the great Kimbu spirit and burn them. Later, as they reached out to other Yali tribes with the gospel, two of the Yali evangelists were killed for doing that. Shortly thereafter, they also killed both Stan and Phil, shooting several arrows into them until they finally fell as they crossed a river. They believed that if they did not kill them, the great Kimbu spirit would bring down wrath upon them. A month later, a month later, an Indonesian patrol led in by the missionary Don Richardson, another missionary, came and to apprehend those who had killed Stan and Phil. When the soldiers came, the Yali mocked them and they shot their arrows at them. And uh, as a result of that, one of the soldiers set up a tripod and placed his machine gun on it and opened fire. While Don Richard and the other missionary guides prayed that God somehow would spare the Yalis. When one of the Yalis dropped dead, the others were in bewilderment because they didn't see any arrows sticking out of them. They'd never heard of guns or, or seen guns before. A total of five Indians were killed and one was taken back uh, with the soldiers it would appear all doors were now closed. I want you to get that. It would appear now that all doors were closed for getting the gospel to these Yali Stone Age tribal people. But two months later, the sovereignty of God, sovereign God, began to work. A missionary aviation fellowship pilot with the Newman family from Portland, Oregon, was flying in these mountains and thought... He thought he was in the com a completely different valley ridge as he battled the torrent, rain, and fog. He couldn't see where he was going, but thought, if I just get lower, there's an uh, airfield that I can land on, a landing strip. But straight ahead in this ridge towered a 14,000-foot mountain. As he dropped lower, he clipped off one of the wings, and then the tail of the pl plane was ripped off. Everyone in the plane was killed except little nine-year-old Paul, who was able to get out of the plane just before it caught on fire. He suffered no broken bones. He did lose his glasses, by the way. And little did he know that the plane crashed just 500 feet or so from where the Yali had killed Stan and Phil. Talk about the sovereignty of God. Right near the wreckage was a bridge cr that crossed the river. Above that, a high up on the mountainside, little nine-year-old Paul saw the, what he thought was huts, but they're really stones. He began making his way up the mountainside to those rocks, unaware of all the eyes that were watching him. 
At the top was one Yali who had pled with the rest not to kill Stan and Phil because he had only done good to them. He had warned them if they had killed them, terrible things would happen to them, and now five of them had been killed. And possibly the soldiers would come back and do them more harm. Now this one Yali with a tender heart saw this little boy crawling out of the wreckage and working his way up the mountainside. Little Paul saw this dark savage with a bone sticking through his nose, but who had tender eyes as he gently reached out and took him in his arm and took him to his hut and began to warm him and provide for him. It would be, it would be through this sovereign act of God that that tribe and many more would open their hearts to the gospel and get wonderfully saved. Now, why do I share that again with you? That same sovereign God, listen to me, that same sovereign God who is going to reach those jolly tribes of the gospel is the same. He is the same sovereign God who has placed you in the house and the neighborhood that you and I live in. Amazing, isn't it? Sovereign God has done that. And through you and me, he wants to reach out to your and my neighbors with this saving gospel of grace. God truly did a sovereign work there as he, as he led there in the Yali situation as well as for you and me. And by the way, when we first came here, we hunted and hunted for a house. We prayed about it. We weren't sure what we're, in fact, was living in a single, we were living in a single wide trailer for, for our kids there and I can go and destroy it, but we won't right now. And uh, God opened the door where we live, but we've been there for 30 years in that house and neighborhood. There's only one way in and one out of our neighborhood. It's made up of 24 houses, and most of our neighbors in those houses are unsaved. In the 30 years that we have lived there, 14, 14 of our neighbors have died. The youngest being in his teens, three died because of terrible accidents, and the rest from health issues and old age. These deaths has opened the door for Mary and me to reach out to these neighbors. When we first moved in, shortly after uh, we uh, were coming up on the Easter service here, and I am not artistic at all, but somehow I was doing secretarial work, and I thought, well, I can somehow develop and design a kind of a colorful Easter bulletin. And so I did that, and we took it around to our neighbors, and my, one of our neighbors came to church. And she kept coming to church. She got wonderfully saved. And two of her daughters started coming to church. We had the joy of baptizing all three of those neighbors. What a joy that was. And then several years later, her husband also came to saving faith. One of our neighbors, his wife, was heavy into alcohol and asked for my counsel in their marriage. The wife did tell me she had trusted Christ. However, shortly after that, she was killed in an accident. After that, her husband did come to saving faith. When we first moved into our house, the neighbor, uh, we thought uh, for the matter, he was a guardian of the alley. He's one of those, you know, uh, between us, almost immediately told me, get that down fence out of, our, uh, out of the alley. His gift for, as my neighbor, was fault finding. That's what we call fault finding for him. You probably don't have any neighbors like that, I know. Maybe you're it instead. Okay. Several years later, on it, we had a family harvest Thanksgiving dinner here, and uh, this neighbor uh, was a former Marine, and we were having as our speaker Bob Boardman, and he was shot in the throat as a Marine uh, during World War II. Bob could only whisper. And so we asked the neighbor's wife, would you like to come? This guy's a Marine, and he did. He and his wife came. We made sure they were at the head table with Bob Boardman and so forth. And then uh, much later on, uh, this neighbor ended up in the hospital over uh, in, uh, in uh, Everett. And he came back, he said, you know, when I was in the hospital, I, I, I saw this uh, paper, it might have even been a plaque, of, of that uh, poem on footprints. And uh, I said, uh, it was interesting because just at that same time or just shortly thereafter, we were having, what, a missions conference? And we had Paul and Margie Powers, and she's the author of Footprints. I said, would you like to meet her? Yeah. And so we took them down, and Paul worked on, uh, on uh, the wife while Margie worked on her. And uh, anyway, a little bit later on, uh, because he's a Marine, uh, uh, Mary had read a book I did as well. It was a chaplain 
uh, in the Iraqi war and how God had mightily used him. And uh, she said to him, would you like to read this book? This, uh, this is the Marine chaplain. Yeah, I'd like to. Later on, Mary saw him. He said, I read that book. At the end of that book, I prayed the prayer to ask Jesus to be my Savior. My son also did that as well. <laughs> In fact, one time around Thanksgiving, Mary was asking, what are you thankful for? He said, well, you know, I used to believe in God like a 20-watt light bulb, but now it's more like a 100-watt light bulb. Boy, what a joy. Just amazing to see what God's doing there with regard to that. Just before our neighbor passed away, we knew that he had come to saving faith and we're trusting his wife to follow as well. There are other stories about our 30 years of living in the same house, the same neighborhood, but due to time, I, I really must move on. But for me personally, listen, for me personally, I must reactivate myself for God in my neighborhood. Do you hear me? You can pray for me. I must reactivate myself personally before God in my neighborhood. I will ask myself the question that I would encourage you also to ask yourself. Do I even know the names of my neighbors around me? Do you even know the names of your neighbors around you? Do I give myself to praying for each one of them? What do I know about them? Do I ever ask God how he might want to me to reach out to them with his love and the gospel? Perhaps if I graciously offered, they would like for me to hold them up in a situation before the Lord in prayer. And if I do that, then I need to go back and say, look, I've been faithfully praying. Have you seen God working in that particular situation? Maybe it's taking to them, and I've done this, a copy of the Our Daily Bread. And given that to your neighbor, as we have done as well. We had one that went to, had two aneurysms plus a heart attack. And in fact, when he came through that, the room was filled full of doctors and nurses and said, we had no idea you were going to survive this. So I had the opportunity to visit and minister to them. To this point, he's, I don't think he's put his faith in the Lord, but if God sovereignly orchestrated each event that led to getting the gospel of saving grace to the Yali Stone Age people, dear ones, has he not also sovereignly orchestrated the placing you and me in our neighborhood we live in? May we reactivate ourselves for God then in our neighborhood. Secondly, next, I'm sorry, next. Reactivate yourself for God in your workplace. Reactivate yourself for God in your workplace. Would you agree with me that God is also sovereignly leading and providing a place where you work? Did you pray about it? <laughs> Did you, boy, Lord, I need a job, I need a good job. Please direct me where you want me to work. And by the way, what a mission field most places of work if not all are, they're quite a mission field. I think the workplace is one of the greatest open mission fields that is least harvested in. I really do. People can work for 10, 20 years next to the same people and never share the faith and never make inroads, any attempts whatsoever. Why would that be? I'm sure I've done that. The scripture that John read to us earlier said, I love it. Jesus had to pass through Samaria. The King James Bible says he must needs go through Samaria. There was a normal route that the Jew, Jewish people always took. They avoided Samaria. God, his heavenly father said, no, I have a sovereign plan for you. This time you're going through Samaria. And you know, of course, what was read there. His sovereignty worked in the life of that woman and several there in Samaria. That's what it means he had to pass through Samaria. He must needs go through Samaria. Should you and I not apply that to our workplace? And I like the last verse that John read to us. <laughs> he read, From the city many of the Samaritans believed in because of the word of the woman who testified. They believed because of who testified. He told me all things that I have done. By the way, in the same setting, he read these words. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say, lift up your eyes and look on the fields that they are white for harvest. Do you think that those words out of Jesus' mouth might be true of your workplace? 
in some ways I have more unique opportunities or I've had more unique opportunities to share the gospel to the unsaved where I have held a secular job than when becoming a pastor. You know how it is when they find out you're a pastor. Oh boy, here you play golf with them sometime. You're going out there and they're hitting awful balls and th- certain things are coming out of their mouth and they say, what do you do? And I think, well, uh, well, let's see, I prepare meals, you know. <laughs> as soon as I say I'm a pastor, it's like, oh no, we got stuck with this guy. <laughs> My. When I was in Bible college, well, let me go on to seminary. In seminary, Mary and I were in Portland, Oregon, and uh, one of the best part-time jobs I ever had, secular jobs, was working for Continental Airlines. Now, Continental Airlines is the only airlines back then that allowed part-timers to immediately fly. And so they said, well, you know, you work for us. We, I did uh, out on the ramp uh, air uh, baggage and luggage and all that stuff. They said... Uh, you need to go on a familiarization so you can boast up how good Continental Airlines. Sure, we'll do it. So I said to Mary, look, why don't we go visit our friends over in Denver? We can leave at like uh, 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 5 o'clock at night or 4 o'clock at night. Be in Denver. We'll take them out to dinner. And then after, we'll just fly back home. So that's what we did. However, however, obviously we had to fly first class. Didn't cost anything. And here they come up with the sirloin steak and all the trimmings. I said, look. I ain't a doing this. I'm eating now. <laughs> we'll take them out afterwards. So that's what we did. And uh, then after it was over, we uh, flew back at about 10 o'clock Denver time. And we flew back and got into Omaha, I'm sorry, into to Portland about uh, 10 o'clock our time here in the evening, just a round trip that day. Later on, they said, you know, you really need to take a familiarization to Hawaii. And I said, yes, we do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we need that. Well, it's first class. And uh, so we went off. I mean, we, look, we had no money back then. We were as poor as Job's turkey. That means you're so poor you have to lean up a fence to, go, to gobble. That's how bad it was. My, my. But during those two years of working at Continental Airlines, I got to share my gospel, the gospel with a number of my co-workers, and two of them folks came to Saving Faith. It's not that I'm so skilled. Right? I don't mean that. It's just an opportunity. We'd, we'd work and uh, tell about midnight, and then we'd go out to Village and Pancake House, and we'd sit there and we'd eat and I'd talk and go back and forth, and I'd talk about uh, what God meant to me and why I'm in seminary or whatever, and uh, maybe the background of my being a child. And uh, uh, two of those guys came to Saving Faith. They married godly women, and they're still walking with the Lord today. Isn't that good? That's good. Just your workplace. Think about your workplace and reactivate yourself for God in your workplace. I don't mean that in any way that you are to shortchange your employer. I don't mean that. You should understand that. By not being diligent in your work or by robbing him using his time to verbally witness to those you work with. But let God use you. Let him use you. Let him guide you and ask him to open those doors for you to minister to those you work with and for. Everybody has problems, people. You surely know that everybody has problems, serious problems, in their marriage, with their kids, with their finances, and that list just goes on and on, health and so forth. It may be you gently reach out and sit to them and let them know that you will be quietly praying for them and then wisely follow up and ask, how are things going? Build a rapport with them. Remember... God is sovereign over where you work and why he has placed you in that workplace. Things at first didn't go so great for Joseph. You remember that, but God was sovereign, wasn't he? Boy, he had a rough go of it, but I'll tell you what, God used him mightily to affect thousands of people because of his faithfulness in that workplace he was put in. In completing my thought about the workplace, let me share a couple of verses out of Titus. Titus chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, because it's important to know what you're going to wear to work. What, what outfit are you going to work, wear to work? Well, Titus 2, 9 and 10 tells you. Here's what it says. Urge bond servants or slaves to be subject to their own masters in everything, to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but, here it goes, but showing all good faith so that they will, here it goes, what you wear to work, so that they will adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior in every respect. That's what you wear to work. Adorn the doctrine of God. Live and work with a righteous life. That's a great verse that tells you and me what to adorn and where to work. Two more to go here quickly. Outline? How many are with me at the outline? How many have fallen asleep? Okay, the outline. Okay, I hope you're with me. Reactivate yourself for God using tracks. 
reactivate yourself for God, for God, using tracks. As I early said, earlier said, I was around six years of age when I got saved. Our little Sweet Home Community Chapel was a tiny church, and in the back wall, they had a track rack. Back then, you didn't need to get a lot of colorful things in tracks. It was just, you know, black print, red print on paper. That was about it. I'd go back there at six years of age, and I'd, I'd load up on those tracks. I'd go out in the neighborhood, knock on doors, and say, here, I want to give you this, and would you people think about coming to church? I'd go to school and take these tracks with me, and during the recess time, I'd pass them out to kids and tell them they need to get saved. They're going to go to hell if they didn't get saved. Use tracks. When we moved to Omaha, I started high school there. It was a mile and a half, and sometimes winter it was very cold walking to, to school. But again, we were very, very poor, as I said, and so I would walk those mile and a half, and I'd take those tracks, and I'd hand them out to people, a lot of Jewish people, by the way, in Omaha, I'd hand them out to people as I went off to school, and at 3.15, I'd get out of school and walk all the way back and pick them off the street and off the sidewalk where they threw them. On Sundays, uh, my close friend, he's still a dear friend of mine uh, of high school days, even today, we would go down to the uh, Burlington train depot and the Union Pacific train de depot, and we'd pass these tracks out to people. Letting them, have the, letting them hear the gospel, letting them read the gospel, have it in their hands, having an opportunity to possibly that God would use it, and they would come to saving faith. The Bible says, Faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the what? Word of Christ. They've got to get the word. Just before that, it says, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news, uh, uh, good news of good things, in Romans chapter 10. Listen, you understand, if people never hear why they need to be saved and how they can get saved, it should be obvious to you and me, they're not going to get saved. We need to give them the opportunity, folks. The other day, Mary and I took some folks out, not from this church, to supper. We had a great supper. Had a good time with them. And afterwards, uh, the one fellow said, you know, let me leave the tip. I said, okay. So he put a big bill down. I said, you know, that, that is really a big bill. I mean, for the, for the price of the meal. Yeah, but she did a good service. I didn't take the tip. I left it just so, you know. <laughs> But later on, I thought to myself, how sad that neither he nor I even thought to have a tract in our pocket to give out to this waitress that did an excellent job. Oh, yeah, they may throw it away. But you talk about uh, uh, doing a favor, a large tip, and you could have put a tract in there so they would know and say, right, thank you for your service, and, and uh, this has been a blessing to me. Folks, you, you see what I'm trying to say? Pastor Bill often just plain walks blindly by and doesn't think about what God's putting before him to allow the gospel to reach unsaved people. I want to encourage our elders, pastor, myself, to get good tracks here. And by the way, you can go online and get them as well. But I am encouraging you to put, get that thing loaded up. When I first came here, we didn't have a track rack. And we put tracks there, and I encourage people to use tracks. Uh, 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 that's a start, isn't it? Can't you say that's a start? To hand a piece of paper to somebody that did something for you that they might possibly read the gospel and get saved? I have something with me. I couldn't believe I tracked these down, but I did. I think maybe we had one at one time here, and that's where I got it. It's called Living Water. It's a gospel of John. Well done. Super well done. And it presents a plan of salvation all the way through it, the gospel of John. I have 60 of them with me here. After we uh, finish this service, the communion and so forth, if I have 60 people that will come here and they'll say, I will look it over carefully and I'll ask God, who do you want me to give this to? By the way, the fellow in our neighborhood that had the double aneurysm and the heart attack, I gave he and his wife one. And I'll give it to you. You can have, take it. I've got 60 of them up here and I'll give it to the first 60 that come. But I want to say again, this is for me. And if God wants to use it in your life, I praise him. But reactivate yourself for God by sharing tracks. Finally, finally. Reactivate yourself for God 
and share your testimony. Reactivate yourself for God and share your testimony, how you got saved. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart, always, always being ready to make a defense for, to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. You know, at least three times in the book of Acts, Paul gave his personal testimony of how he got saved. Yeah, at least three times. He gave his personal testimony to people who were unsaved of how he got saved. By the way, if you go on a mission trip with Mary, you will be forced to write out, to develop and write out your three-minute testimony. Okay. You have to write it out, you have to memorize it, and you have to practice it. Okay? It has three parts. The first part is, what was your life right, light, I'm sorry, what was your life, get it right, what was your life like before you got saved? Second, specifically, how did you get saved? And there you give the plan of salvation. And third, how has your life changed since you got saved? Three-minute testimony, because you don't have a lot of time when you're talking to somebody, but you're going to tell them what your life was like before you got saved, specifically how you got saved and received eternal life and assurance, and how your life has changed since. Now, every one of you here, even little kids, could sit down and write out those three things, think it through, write it out. You can even refine it, work it out better and better and better, and then begin to share it with one another until you're comfortable, and then go out and share it with somebody who's unsaved. Go out and share your three-minute testimony. Have you ever thought through and written out your personal testimony of how you got saved? It really is a powerful witnessing tool. Powerful. If you will prepare yourself and let God use you, he will, listen, he, the sovereign, will open the doors for you to do that, and like that woman at the well who Jesus uh, met and then went to the city and shared her testimony, the Lord may cause many, because of you and me, to come to saving faith. As I said at the beginning of this message, I prepared it primarily for myself. I really mean that. I really mean that. I need to, Mary and I work at what the names of our, our neighbors are at our table or during devotional time. We need to start one by one, faithfully, round the, I mean, day after day, pray for their salvation, pray for open doors and so forth. Pray about what they're going through. And I sense that uh, God's exhortation is to me personally, reactivate yourself for God. Now I need to take the necessary steps to do just that. If the Lord has spoken to your heart as well, through what I've shared with you this morning, may you also take those necessary steps. By the way, during our equipping hours, uh, Chris Weathers here is teaching evangelism up in the office building in the upper part there. And he said, you're welcome to attend that. And that would be an opportunity for you to even grow more in being an effective witness for Christ. And remember this, it's the sovereignty of God who is working in your life and my life as well. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity of sharing this, but now I pray that we will be, and I will be, more and more involved in worldwide missions right here at home, in my family, because I have a number of people, Lord, that are close to me that are unsaved. They're one heartbeat from hell right now. I know, Lord, uh, we have uh, uh, extended family members that also are unsaved and moving through life and don't have a clue of what's about to uh, affect them for eternity. And then, Father, my neighborhood, oh, so many in our neighborhood, still lost, still perishing, still searching, still empty. How I pray that you would work in Mary and me that we might see more of them come to saving faith. Thank you for the ones that you have saved, Lord. Mercifully save them. Thank you for that. Thank you that you would even see fit somehow, some way to use Mary and me. But may you use my brothers and sisters in the neighborhoods that you have sovereignly placed them in just like you did uh, uh, the uh, Paul and the ones that came after him, uh, Stan and Phil, and those that brought the gospel to the Yali people. May you be glorified in all this, we pray. And as we come to the communion table, Lord, would you be, uh, accept our worship there too, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.